Hello and welcome to Dialogue. The foreign ministers of the group of seven nations met in London. It is their first face-to-face -face talk since the outbreak of COVID-19. Their focus includes economic recovery, the COVID pandemic, DPRK nuclear issues, and as you've probably guessed, how to deal with China. So what actually came out of the G7 meeting? How will the U.S. and its allies adjust their relations with China and Russia? And what role will the G7 play in global governance in the future? To discuss these issues, I'm joined by Professor John Gon at the University of International Business and Economics, Professor Joe Toker at the American Graduate School in Paris, Einar Tengen is Independent Current Affairs Commentator, and Isabel Hilton, CEO of China Dialogue. That is our topic. I'm Wang Guan. Hi, Isabel. Let me go to you in London. The foreign ministers uh, from G7 decided to convene this meeting in person instead of virtually, despite the still precarious COVID situation in parts of Europe. Uh, why do you think is the urgency to meet in person? Well, I think diplomacy is really, there are limits to the amount of diplomacy you can do over screens and the number of people you can easily have on a virtual call. Um, but you're absolutely right. The situation, uh, we were reminded today of how precarious the situation remains when two members of the Indian delegation tested positive for COVID and the Indian delegation is now self-isolating. They are invited as guests to the G7 meeting, so they're not uh, members of the G7. Um, but in order for the meeting to continue, uh, everyone is sitting behind screens, but still in the same room. We have a lot of complicated uh, situations to deal with this year, including, of course, climate change, biodiversity, and all of those really big issues in which, you, you, you know, if you're involving talks with more than 100 countries, for example, you really need to be present. So I think this meeting, which, as you say, is the first in 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 the same physical space it's it's testing out how uh, how quickly we can return to uh, a more interactive more in-person uh, diplomatic context so that the discussions that we really need to have uh, can flourish this year right professor toker in paris what do you think came out of this foreign ministers meeting of g7 well, I think uh, uh, our fellow, our colleague in London, uh, indeed, that was sort of a rehearsal of getting diplo diplomatic trains back on the rails. Um, of course, there is a limit to what you can achieve in diplomatic ways when you use screens in order to save the situation in an emergency situation such as ours, the entire world. And whoever um, uh, um, uh, had a chance to see in real eyes how those summits uh, really happen, it's not only what you say and what you hear and what the speeches say and what the communique formulate, but it's mainly, even more importantly, what diplomats, ministers, presidents, prime ministers say to each other, whispering to each other in the, in, in the corridors right before entering the meeting and as they go out of the meeting. So this is very important. Let's just see the, 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 incident, the unpleasant incident with two members or three members of the Indian delegation in London is, is actually preoccupying, but let's, let's hope that that would be the exception. Now, what is it to be achieved? I would, if I had to do a synthetic presentation, I would say that over the major geostrategic issues, which would be those of the relations of the West, I mean, mainly the US and Europe, but also Asian uh, uh, partners, versus Russia and versus China. And there are two options here. Either are we going to see the tone, the m diplomatic music which we've heard over the last three, four months, which is assertive, sometimes offensive, sometimes aggressive on both sides. Will that music just go on? Or whether that music was indeed the way to clear the grounds for some more moderate and constructive um, um, dialogue between China and the West and mm -hmm. Russia and the West. Yeah, let me, let me ask our colleagues, uh, John Gon, Professor John Gon in Washington, D.C., uh, you know, to follow up on Professor uh, Joe Toker's comment, do you think the tone and the music of antagonizing China and Russia from G7 are getting louder or they're going as previously? 
No, I think it's getting louder, absolutely. I think, uh, especially for China, um, I think, uh, you know, undoubtedly China is the central theme for, for this conference. Um, and I think, uh, you know, these seven countries uh, do feel the real need to sort of unify their stance to come up with a, a, a so-called common strategy against China. Uh, and this is actually quite concerning to me, uh, especially, uh, you know, the news came the other day that the, the CAI, that's the European China um, uh, investment treaty has been, uh, the approval process in Europe has been suspended. Uh, you know, you have to wonder how much of it has to do with uh, the United States government. Um, so, so maybe in, in the context of, of all these uh, developments, um, I do see a, a real risk here, a risk of uh, sort of these seven countries and their allies uh, banding together against China and to some extent Russia as well, uh, and, and enforcing um, uh, you know, both sides into some kind of alliance, which is the last thing we want here. So, uh, so I think it's, um, it, it's not a pleasant development for, from China's perspective. <clears throat> right. Uh, Einar Tengen in, in Beijing, we know that China is still the focus of G7 discussions. In an interview with the Financial Times, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken said this. He said, it is not our purpose to try to contain China or to hold China down. And he added that the West would defend, quote unquote, the international rules based order from a subversive attempts by any country, including China. What do you make of what Blinken has said? Well, it's uh, the use post uh, hypocritical uh, nonsense that you would expect. I mean, I would agree with uh, Professor John Gong. Uh, things are heating up. Uh, the G7, remember, this is a group that was supposed to represent the richest, most sophisticated uh, economies in the world, uh, a group who could guide the rest of the world. Not one of them had a positive year last year as opposed to China. China is the number two uh, economy in the world uh, by PPP standards, number one, but it's not involved in this. So this has just become a recruiting uh, you know, seminar for uh, people who wanted to go anti-China. You'll notice there were very few uh, solutions offered, only complaints. It was only talking about how China was not measuring up to what they wanted and how they would get together and force China to do it, despite uh, Blinken's comment that they're not trying to hold China down. It's just uh, it's simply not true. Uh, you know, Isabel, let me focus on China. Uh, this is a very important question here. Um, you know, Blinken, uh, the Secretary of State, uh, Antony Blinken, talked about the rules-based international order. Uh, do you think the international rules-based order is broken? Uh, I mean, has it not delivered for global trade, commerce, and development, uh, human growth for the past decades? Or do you think this international rules-based order is just a, a convenient uh, excuse, pretext, uh, to contain a rising China? Well, I think it's, uh, the rules-based order has delivered um, pretty well over the last 20 or 30 years, particularly for China. You know, imagine where China would be if it hadn't joined the WTO. Imagine where China would be if it hadn't had access to, to global markets. So it's been a mutual, it's been a, a, a situation of mutual benefit. But it is definitely creaking right now. And it's creaking for a number of reasons. And I think we should, you know, take a kind of balanced view of this. Um, it, there is concern. When China says it, it, it is not happy with the rules and wants to rewrite them, that's obviously going to get everyone's attention because these are the rules, you know, that have pretty much prevailed since 1945. So people do want to know uh, if China wants to rewrite them, how it wants to rewrite them. It's not really clear. There is also agreement about whether um, about about things like reform of the WTO, which is perceived as, you know, needing it, it. There's a feeling that the WTO can't really cope with the new order. So again, how are we to reform that? And that's clearly got to be the you know, something on which you know we 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 seek agreement. Um, and there are the perennially difficult issues of human rights, of what view we take of human rights, of what China's commitment is to human rights and what and what its understanding of human rights is. Now, you know, this is um, obviously a very difficult topic, but it is one of the things that has informed a phenomenon both in the United States and in, in Europe, uh, which we also should take note of, is that opinion polls suggest that views of China are extremely unfavorable amongst general publics at the moment. In, and when you have a situation like that in, in, in electorates, 
elected politicians have to pay attention. They can't ignore the wishes of the people. So, you know, we are in a delicate situation. What I find encouraging, however, is that, you know, you, you, you I, I know some of my colleagues feel that the situation is getting uh, worse, but I think that the tone is calmer. And I think that the really important thing is that, for example, over climate change in the last um, couple of weeks, we've had very encouraging signs which suggest that in issues that we absolutely have to cooperate on, we will find ways to talk. And after all, you know, in the Cold War, the US and the USSR still talked. You know, we have to manage these relationships. We have to acknowledge the differences and we have to find ways of containing mm -hmm. the fallout. Uh, because although the multilateral order may be creaking, there is an old um, English expression, uh, advice to children, always keep a hold of nurse for fear of finding something worse, Hilaire Belloc's remark. And that until we have a better idea, I think we should hang on to this system and we should try to make it work. I mean, Professor Toker, from a European perspective, has China been a subversive power, as Anthony Blinken has indicated or alluded to? Well, um, I wouldn't globalize it and put it this way in, 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 in such words. Uh, but you've got uh, I mean, the variety of opinions of European capitals regarding China and the US-China uh, uh, polarity. Um, you have some governments in Europe which indeed are uh, uh, very worried about what, uh, what are the medium and long run intentions of China. There are other governments in Europe, uh, uh, I would say uh, Berlin would be one, the, uh, Paris would be one, who um, um, take a more moderate view um, as to that. It also concerns the bilateral relations with China holds with um, uh, different countries in Europe. There are 27 members of the European Union. There is an entire uh, different set of re bilateral relations between China and Eastern and Central European countries. When you compare it to the relations China has with Germany or France or the Netherlands or Belgium or, or Spain, Italy is a special case. So we have a variety of cases here. But um, we, sh we should concentrate actually on the element which we had already, I think, isolated over the first few mom uh, minutes of this conversation, which is that we are mainly under the impact of this new standing formation of US and the West, Europe, versus Russia and China. And this is a, a type of dynamics which will certainly shape also elements within the bilateral relations that specific countries may have or have not with China or with Russia for that matter. Professor Zhang Gong, what do you think? I mean, has China, uh, you know, been, you know, a um, subversive and aggressive power as was portrayed by uh, many in the West? I think this is a false narrative. Uh, first, let me clarify that China never had the interest or intention of rewrite the rule-based international system. Uh, what Chinese government has said is that we would like to uh, be part of it. Uh, if not, uh, you know, it's in support of that system. Albeit, you know, there are rooms for improvement as we all know it, and China wants to contribute to that improvement. For example, the things going on at WTO uh, is, a, is, a, is a perfect story of how United States and China and other Western powers can work together to improve the system. This is not uh, about a, a subverting a, a existing system. Absolutely, it's, on the contrary, it's the exact opposite. Um, second, I think um, China has never done anything to subvert uh, foreign governments in a sense of, you know, uh, in, in, in the 1970s, uh, the Soviet Union, China sort of uh, went around the world trying to bring about revolutions. No, absolutely not. Uh, China has, hasn't been engaged in any proxy wars or any other sort of interference in foreign governments uh, for a long, long time, at least, you know, th three, four decades. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I don't quite understand why China is portrayed that way. I think the, um, probably the feeling on the West is not so much really about uh, China being a, uh, a, 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 a uh, a revisionist state or, 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 or subverting power in that sense. I think it's more about China is setting an alternative example. 
And that alternative example is sort of putting a glimpse of uh, the, 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 the model that the United States has been promoting all around the world, especially against the backdrop of you know, situations social with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and, and the China development model has been quite attractive to a lot of countries. I think that is mostly this so-called risk or threat is coming from. And I think you have to be fair that, you know, when, 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 uh, when Antonin Blinken is talking about competition, well, I think, you know, this is a, a fair competition. You know, let, let the two countries compete uh, in terms of sort of a, a, a passively exerting their influence internationally by setting examples. That's what uh, Joe Biden has said, right? Uh, it's, the, it's the power by example, it's not by example by power. Right. Exactly. <clears throat> Yeah, so Einer, um, you know, in this interview with the Financial Times, Anthony Blinken also rejected claims of the Cold War between the U.S. and China. He said that I, meaning Anthony Blinken, resist putting labels on most relationships, including this one, because it is complex. And when I look at the relationship, I see adversarial aspects, I see competitive aspects, I see cooperative aspects, all three. Um, anything impressed you in his latest statement? No, I mean, it, it goes back. I mean, for a guy who says he doesn't like to have, uh, make labels, he certainly said quite a bit in Anchorage, Alaska, uh, which set off the, the Chinese side. I mean, I mean, th this is just kind of, you know, popping around. He, he wants to have it both ways. He wants to say, oh, we're the good nation and we're trying to do the good work and we're just dealing with a very difficult uh, China. But, you know, look, look at the agenda that was on here. It was about uh, Russia, China, Iran, Myanmar. Uh, where was Afghanistan? Uh, where's Iraq? Uh, where, where's Syria? Where's Yemen? I mean, you can see quite clearly that this is a, a biased thing. So, you know, no, there's no discussion of the issues that the U.S. has been involved with, which involve all the things that they're talking about they're accusing China of. And this goes back to this kind of notion that instead of actually offering solutions, I'm going to accuse you of things I have done or things I intend to do. This was a Trump special. He always uh, managed to do that somehow. The press was always taken in by it. But I, I agree with John. I, I, I regret I, this false narrative that's being pushed around that China's the one who's trying to change things is nonsense. I mean, China's taking over the presidency of the UN. What are they saying? Let's have multilateralism. Let's have a, a true uh, system that needs change. But let us make it more democratic. Every nation is a sovereign nation and, and deserves to have their voice heard. That as opposed to, you know, five, five countries of which China's one uh, dictating what can and can happen at the UN. There needs to be change. I think China is not trying to change the rules, but trying to find a way forward. I don't think anybody, uh, uh, my colleagues, would say that the UN is a perfect institution to go forward. Bringing the WTO is another false narrative. Quite frankly, the Doha round has sat moribund for these many years simply because the wealthy nations uh, have not responded to the social needs of the less wealthy nations. And you see that again in COVID. There is, you know, if you go back and read the communique, joint communique last year in 2020, uh, you know, it was all about things that none, none of which were accomplished. They talked about getting together and, and paying attention to the needs of the world. Nothing happened. Instead, as soon as the virus, uh, the vaccine was available, they hoarded it, kept it to themselves. And even as India suffers, uh, they are being very slow in deciding what they want to do. Blinken says, uh, accuses China, that says, I will not trade shots uh, in the arm for principles. Yet, on the other hand, he's not willing mm. or to advocate that the uh, vaccine uh, be distributed, the basis to make the vaccine be distributed, uh, basically intellectual free property to the very nations who need it. So which is it? Right. Um, Isabel, uh, in London, let me go to you. Um, German Foreign Minister Maas said that the world's major democracies need a strategy, need a strategy on human rights. Um, understand that there are real concerns in the West about human rights situations all over the world, uh, particularly in China. Um, how do you think putting diplomatic and political pressure through a multilateral platform like this may or may not solve the situation? I mean, what is really a, a more constructive way of uh, you know, having a, a fruitful dialogue on human rights? 
Well, you know, over the years, there have been many different approaches to uh, dialogue on human rights from, you know, public declarations to resolutions at the UN to uh, the more kind of um, private conversations uh, and dialogues that the EU and uh, China have, have run for years. So there have been many different approaches. I, mean, I can't say that if you were to measure results um, objectively, you would find, you know, very much to be said for any of these uh, approaches. But, but clearly, we have differences, and we need to keep talking about differences. Um, I think the, the one one of the things we really must acknowledge, though, at this point, is that, you know, if these if these issues are not managed, if we don't find a way to talk about them constructively, then they do have real effects. The EU investment treaty negotiated over seven years, signed last uh, late last year, and now the uh, implementation of that or the the ratification of that is in serious doubt because of these unmanaged differences over human rights and and the trading of sanctions. China has sanctioned members of the European Parliament. The European Parliament has to ratify this treaty. So you know. If these things are not managed well, then other interests become very difficult. So I guess one thing that we're seeing in this G7 and in the preparations for the for the for the G7 leaders meeting in the autumn is the, is the a return to to conversations about the degree to which human rights, which you know the G7 countries essentially share the same view of human rights, but what varies is what they do about it and and how salient questions of human rights are in their relations with other countries and that really is what we're talking about at this point you know how much of an issue is this and as i said given the state of public opinion it, it becomes very difficult they don't have much room for maneuver frankly right now over human rights and the relationship with China, it, it would be very difficult for a European or, or a US politician, you know, to take a, a, a very radical yeah, exactly. uh, view. Their, their politics so on all sides. So properly managed, there won't be much uh, freedom of action for, for any of these politicians. But I think we need to get back to, to a more sober discussion, frankly. Yeah, Professor Toker, um, another issue is, of course, Russia. Antony Blinken said, uh, you know, they reaffirmed their support for the independence, sovereignty, and territorial integrity of Ukraine. And also uh, the G7 is thinking about uh, building a proposal to counter what they call Russian propaganda and disinformation. But on the other hand, President Joe Biden said he's willing to meet Vladimir Putin in June. Um, how would you rate, uh, you know, the Biden administration's approach towards Russia so far? Well, I don't think that um, uh, profoundly there is a contradiction between being harsh and assertive regarding Russia, indeed, when it comes to the Ukrainian crisis, indeed, when it comes to the cyber activities uh, 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 of Russia all over the world, including the West itself and the US itself, and the um, um, availability of President Biden, so to speak, to meet with Putin even I would say, in some, to some extent, the ambition of President Biden to meet with, uh, uh, with, uh, with, with Russian president. Uh, there is no contradiction on that. It is, in a way, a projector towards other issues we had discussed today. I mean, the fact that Biden and his foreign minister, his uh, secretary of state, are saying very harsh things about China, about Russia, the fact that the discourse and the rhetorics about human rights, which is sort of an ac accusation type rhetorics when it comes to China and when it comes to Russia in the mouths and the, um, and the spokespersons of the West is being uh, forwarded, does not mean that we are already in a stage there is no ambition to talk to each other. On the contrary, in a sense, the element which count is the fact that whatever the positions of different um, um, countries in the West may be on human rights or other issues on, on Ukraine, on cyber wars, etc., there is a need, there is an authentic need of the West as well as that of Russia and or China to uh, 
cooperate, to do some common work with the other side. Look at the situation in Syria. Look at the, sit look at the new Iranian nuclear set of problems. Look at the situation in North Korea in over, and others. They're all, over all these fronts and issues, the Americans need the Russians. The Americans need the Chinese. To some extent, it works the other way around. Look at the situation in Africa, in which both Western powers and China may have their voice regarding a very delicate situation. So yes, the tone is heating up. We don't know exactly to what extent the intentions are there as solid mm -hmm. as the tone is, but the need to work together still exists in a considerable way. Yeah, the British uh, Foreign Minister Rob told reporters that the meeting uh, you know, could provide an opportunity, a very good opportunity to talk to India about how, seven, how G7 nations could help the country amid its spike in COVID cases. Um, Professor Zhang Gan, what do you think is at stake in India's COVID-19 crisis and how can uh, organizations like G7 help? Um, well, I, mean, I think you know, we all understand that the situation in India is really grave. People are dying you know, by the thousands every day. Uh, it's very disheartening to see that. And of course, uh, you know, every country, uh, people around the world have an interest in helping with India because you know, this is actually happening themselves. So, uh, so I, think, um, you know, I think I would suggest that we, uh, we, we uh, you know, watch people by their uh, actions instead of just words. Uh, you know, how many uh, uh, equipment they've sent into India, how many vaccines they've sent into India, equi medical equipment, things like that. So I think, uh, you know, I think at least I, I want to speak for China that uh, even though, you know, we have those sort of, you know, border skirmishes uh, and, 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 and contentions on the border, but, the, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, China did offer a lot of help. And it's widely reported that China shipped in uh, on an emergency basis uh, tons and tons of equipment, oxygen supplies, stuff like that. So, so I think, uh, you know, what uh, the Chinese government's done is, is absolutely right that, uh, you know, this is a time that uh, we set our differences aside and uh, of a helping hand. Now, I, I want to also make a comment on the previous issue you raised about Russia. You know, at the G7, um, they uh, have a, uh, a come up with a, 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 a agreement that they have to counter Russia's uh, misinformation and disinformation campaign. But regarding you know the misinformation and disinformation, um, it probably currently what's going on right now is the. You know, the biggest misinformation, disinformation campaign against China on the so-called genocide in Xinjiang at this point in recent years. Uh, this is a vast, vast uh, 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 propaganda campaign that is absolutely fabricated, that's not based on truth. Um, in my view, you know, the, the so-called human rights issue in Xinjiang is really about you know, combating terrorism, combating uh, radical Islamic uh, uh, jihadists, these are the things that you know the, the the West do have a common interest with China. So um, so on that note, I think you know this is totally uh, unjustified to uh, take on China on the so-called human rights issue. Um, Einer, we have 40 seconds left. Uh, your expectations, your uh, view on you know the role of G7 uh, in the global economic recovery going forward. G7 has become an anachronism. It was supposed to be the richest and most powerful countries, influential ones. It, it, it has excluded both China and India. Uh, it has, as I said before, just become a recruiting ground for Biden and his administration as they uh, try to take on China. And despite uh, everything they say, it's to keep China down. Einer, thank you so much. Uh, Professor John Gon, thank you for joining us. Professor Toker in Paris and Isabel in London. Thank you all so very much, and thank you for watching Dialogue. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing.